Good morning. Good morning. And grace and peace to you. Just uh, on a lighter note before we get into our lesson, <coughs> if any of you received too many chocolate bunnies or chocolate eggs this morning, uh, I will be glad to come by and uh, take them off your hands. So just, uh, just let me know. All right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1. We are here today, as you know, because of a man called Jesus of Nazareth. That we believe that he really lived. Uh, that he suffered on a cross, a Roman cross. He died there, was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, as we just commemorated in his suffering. We believe that he was and is the Son of God. God become flesh. That's why we're here. If any of that is not true, let's just go home. And the rest of life is really meaningless. It is. It has no meaning whatsoever. If any of that is not true. We believe it is true. And we want to talk about that cross today on which Jesus died. Since the gospel has been preached, that the cross has been misunderstood. Uh, certainly by those who don't believe in it, don't believe in Jesus. But even to some extent by those who do believe. Uh, people recognizing Jesus' death was necessary, that he did die for us, we understand that. But what actually was happening at the cross? Why did that work, so to speak? Why did that give us salvation? And we're, we're going to make you think a little bit this morning. Occasionally we do that. God wants us to think, enter into his wisdom, because God doesn't do anything without purpose. He uh, has his reasons and his methods, and he expects us to understand them. So, in fact, we can appreciate what he's done, and we can explain it to others. So let's uh, start in 1 Corinthians 1.18, and Paul kind of presents that idea here about the cross. He says, for the word of, cro of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. We contrast here as Paul contrasted the foolishness of men with the wisdom of God. How do you see the cross? That's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. Paul says we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. They couldn't quite see how that would do anything for them. 
In fact, it was written in their law, cursed is the one who's hanged on a tree. The Gentiles find it foolishness. They were seeking for wisdom, or shall we even say philosophy? You know, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, those were the kinds of things that they were interested in, the wet kind of wisdom and thinking and rationalization, and they just couldn't see how someone dying on a cross could do anything for them. So how is the cross the power and the wisdom of God? And I'm not standing here before you today to say that I understand all of this. Because who can understand the ways and the wisdom of God? I don't, only what he reveals to us can we understand. But this demonstrates... The cross demonstrates how God chose to deal with mankind's sin problem. And that's what the cross is all about. It's about your sins and my sins. If we had no sins, there would be no cross. No need for it. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. I'm going to look at a couple of things here in this passage of Scripture that were happening at the cross. And then we're going to do two comparisons, or if you will, two convergences. There are some things coming together at the cross that we need to understand. So let's look at 1 Peter 2, 19 to 24. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. But what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return while suffering. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed Jesus was suffering and we often talk about his suffering we talk about the pain the agony, and we've had lessons on what the crucifixion might have, or, yeah, the crucifixion might have been like. But Peter is pointing out the fact that that suffering was unjust; that he did not deserve that. And he draws on the example from his day of many slaves and servants who suffered unjustly because they had harsh masters cruel masters. And he said, you know, if you did something wrong, you suffer for it, well, that's your fault. You just have to take it. But if you're a good servant and still your master is just a mean and nasty person and they beat you or deprive you of food or whatever they did, you still need to take it <coughs> because that is pleasing to God. Now, in our day and age, that does not resonate, does it? We want our rights. We want fairness. And we want justice. And I'm not saying that that's not something we should want. But what we see here that God sees when people suffer unjustly, and he says, 
I see that, and that I appreciate that you're doing that, even though you've done the right thing and you're still suffering for it. And you see, that's, that's everything that was happening here with Jesus. This was all unjust. He didn't deserve any of it. Peter points out he was totally without sin. He didn't even say anything wrong. It was an unjust suffering. What was happening here? It was a couple of things coming together. And this, again, is God's plan. He bore, he took our sins on that cross. That's the way God saw it. His, he was taking our sins. Your sins and my sins were laid on the back of Jesus, as it were. And he suffered unjustly because he didn't deserve it, but he took our sins. Peter says, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There was an exchange being made at the cross. Look at this. He was taking our sins, suffering unjustly, so that we might receive his righteousness because he was without sin. And we know that we have to be righteous in order to stand before God on the last day. And it's not our righteousness, it's not mine, it's not yours, it's his, because we're in Christ. So the exchange is made at the cross, our sins for his righteousness. This is the way God saw the cross. This was its purpose. You know, we talk about the depth of the wisdom of God. He thought it all through. It was not just an arbitrary thing. There's things happening at the cross. And this is the first thing we want to consider. This exchange was made. Our second thought here, two things converging at the cross, two opposites, very much opposite. Mankind's evil and God's love came together at the cross. Let's look at Psalm 22. Evil was everywhere that day. I'm going to start in Psalm 22 and verse 6. And this is, uh, as we read through here, you're going to see how this was a prophecy of what happened to Jesus and a reflection of a crucifixion. But I am a worm and not a man a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are, you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. But there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, 
A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. There was envy that day. We read in one place where Pilate said he knew they were delivering him up because of envy. There was self-righteousness on the part of the Jewish leaders. There was hatred. One place says, they hated me without a cause. He was rejected by his own people, betrayed by Judas, deserted by the rest of the disciples. Peter denied him. There was lying at this trial, ridicule, mocking, the torture, the flogging, the murder. Mankind's evil was on display that day at the cross. But the love of God was also on display. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The love of God was on display here, although those standing there didn't really understand what was going on. But this is what John explains and is explained in other places. God's love revealed his plan to save humanity, Jesus taking our sins, standing against all that was evil, suffering unjustly. He took that all for us. In Luke 6, we read, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This was God fulfilling those words. Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what God was doing at the cross. Overcoming evil with good. You know, this concept is kind of foreign to us. Even as Christians, we, we, we want to fight back. We want to hurt people that hurt us. This is very different. The love of God meeting the evil of the world and the question is, guess who won? Guess who won? The love of God won. It might not look like that today, but it did. It triumphed. Jesus won. He overcame the evil with the good. And that is a message for us today. This is how evil is overcome, with good. Praying for our enemies, doing good to those who hurt us, and trusting God, even if we have to suffer unjustly, because God says that's a good thing. God bless you for doing that. That's God's way. And sometimes I think we've lost that in today's church. Our last thought. Two other things coming together at the cross. And for this, we're going to go to Romans, starting in chapter 5. 
coming together at the cross is God's justice and forgiveness. Both things at the same time in his son. We know that God cannot overlook sin. He just doesn't turn away and, and pretend it's not there. That's not God. That's not his character. It goes against everything that's God, a holy, perfect God. If we think back through the scriptures and through time, God has dealt with sin in, in some different ways, if you will. Some sins he dealt with immediately, so to speak. I remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He came down in person and said, I'm going to go, you know, this was, this was for Abraham's benefit and, and ours, but I'm going to go see if the sin and the wickedness is really as bad as what, uh, what I'm hearing. And, of course, it was. Abraham pleaded for the righteous, but there weren't enough righteous to save the, the two cities. And what happened? The fire and brimstone, they're destroyed. They die. It's over because of their wickedness. Then under Moses, there were the animal sacrifices that were given to make atonement for sin. This, of course, was anticipating the cross. The sins were not really forgiven but remembered every year. But we read in the book of Hebrews how the cross, the blood of Christ, went clear back under Moses so those sins would truly be remitted. And then some sin was just forgiven outright. I remember David, you know, the situation with Bathsheba and his, her husband Uriah and put, being put to death. And uh, the prophet told him, Nathan says, you know, your sin won't be held against you. Well, that again would have been anticipating the cross because God just can't do away with sin. He just can't speak it away. That's not his nature, and it's not possible. Let's look at Romans 5.12, first of all, to understand about sin and what was happening at the cross. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and that would be Adam, Adam and Eve together, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So that's what happens because of sin, and that's the penalty for sin. You remember what God said to Adam and Eve there in the garden. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. You know, sometimes we try to make this into something else, but we shouldn't. That's the penalty for sin. It's death. You die. It's over. So now let's look at God's justice at the cross, Romans 3.21. What happened with Jesus at the cross? He died, right? Unjustly, but he died. Romans 3.21. Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Paul says here that he displayed him publicly. That was the cross. For all to see. For all the world to see, this is what I'm doing here. He's dying for all to see Jesus there. A propitiation in his blood, meaning in his death, the sacrificial death of his innocent son was acceptable to God 
for our sins. The justice of God was served against sin. Jesus died for our sins. You know, we say that over and over again, but I don't think we understand that that was God's justice being served against all sin. And since God's justice was served, then he could offer forgiveness, you see. Until his justice against sin had been satisfied, God really couldn't forgive anybody. He couldn't do it. But in his son, Jesus Christ, it was satisfied when he took our sins. So then he could become, as it says in 26, he would be just, he would be right, he would execute justice against sin, and then he would be the justifier or the one who would declare righteous those who were in Christ and believed in Christ by faith. He could say, you're righteous because you accept my son's sacrifice just as I have. And so that brings us to our last thought there in Ephesians chapter 1. Because of all that, in him, meaning in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood or his death, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Jesus taking our sins in his body so that we might be declared righteous. The exchange was made. The love of God, the evil of man meeting at the cross, and the love of God winning out in Jesus. The justice of God being served against sin because Jesus died for sin so that God then could offer forgiveness to you and me at the cross of Christ. A lot happening. We need to understand how God used the death of his son to offer to us and to all mankind forgiveness of sin and therefore life eternal. So we need to process this power and the wisdom of God at the cross, the amazing grace that was offered to us and to share this with a lost and dying world who don't understand evil, who don't understand wickedness, who don't understand God, and certainly they don't understand the cross of Christ. God bless you, and we praise God that his son was raised from the dead.